Instead of doing my topology homework yesterday, I decided to sit down and count out 1,000 grains of rice. This took me about 16 minutes to complete, and while it cost me my dignity, it's definitely possible. But what if I wanted to count 1 billion grains of rice? Well, assuming I don't slow down or sleep, it would take me over 35 years to count the last grain. You see, as numbers get exponentially larger, it becomes harder and harder to visualize these jumps. Past the marks of millions and billions, numbers start to feel the same stupidly large. But to give a better idea of these jumps, I'm going to use an example by Scott Chepiel. Take a standard deck of 52 cards, shuffle it, then lay them down. How many different ways could we shuffle this deck of cards? Well, early on, we can see it's a lot. If I swap these two cards, I have a newly shuffled deck, and same with any other pair. So let's generalize this out. If we lay out our cards, we see that there are 52 different positions that the King of Hearts can be in. Now, for each of these 52 different variations, there are 51 locations that the Queen of Hearts can be in. For each of these 52 times 51 variations, there are 50 different locations that the Jack of Hearts can be in. And we can continue this process all the way down to the Ace of Spades. The result we're left with is 52 times 51 times 50 and so on, otherwise known as 52 factorial. Calculating this out, we get approximately 8 followed by 67 zeros. Now, this is obviously large, but how large? Well, I want you to set a timer for 52 factorial seconds and select your favorite spot on the equator. I'm going with Sydney, Australia. Standing at that point, wait 1 billion years, then take a step forward. Wait another billion years before your next step, and so on. Once you've lapped the Earth, remove a single drop of water from your closest ocean and keep going. Keep lapping the Earth, removing one drop at a time until you've drained all the water in every ocean. We're done! No far! Refill the oceans, place down a single sheet of paper and repeat every last step. Every time you complete this process, place down another sheet of paper. Once your stack of paper reaches the sun, you'll finally be done. But you won't. In fact, if you look at your timer, it'll still show 8.063 times 10 to the 67 seconds, the same time you started with. You'd need to do this over 1,000 more times to be freed from this purgatory. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. A Google is a million billion 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 times larger than 52 factorial, which is magnitude smaller than a Google Plex. But are those numbers even useful? You see, 52 factorial is the solution to an actual problem, but a Google Plex's main function is to simply be large. A Google Plex is the number one followed by a Google zeros, and this number is impossible to write down. And not in a way that you don't have enough time to write it down, I mean there's physically not enough matter in the entire universe to store all of its digits. It's estimated there are between 10 to the 78 and 10 to the 82 atoms in the entire observable universe, but there are 10 to the 100 digits in this monstrously large number. This means that if we assigned each atom a single digit, we'd need a billion billion universes to write out a single Googleplex. Compared to a Google, which I can just put here on the screen, a Googleplex is completely unimaginable. But in my opinion, it does a pretty crap job of being large. You see, TS kind of PMO because a Googleplex is first off meaningless because it doesn't act as a solution to a problem, and second off, tiny. When you compare a Googleplex to something like Graham's number, it effectively becomes zero. In fact, there's a popular statement that if you try to imagine Graham's number, your head would physically collapse into a black hole and you wouldn't even get close. But there's an actual use for this monstrously large number, and it has to do with hypercubes. Take the four vertices of a square. The number of ways we can connect these dots with edges is six. Now we color the edges with two colors. Moving to a 3D cube, we do the same. With all of these colorings, we wish to avoid coloring an entire face with one color. Clearly with 2D, 3D, and 4D, this is quite simple. So surely as we go up in dimensions, we can always avoid this. Right? Well, no, when we get to Graham's number dimensions, we can't avoid this. So what is this number? Well, in order to just represent this number, I need to introduce some new notation. We all know three plus three is six, three times three is three plus three, three times, and three to the power of three is three times three, three times. But another way we can write this is three arrow three. Extending this, we now get that three double arrow three is three arrow three arrow three, or three to the power of three to the 
the power of 3, which works out to be about 7.6 trillion. This means that with just 3 arrows, we have a stack of 7.6 trillion 3s, which is already unfathomably larger than a Googleplex. This is Knut's up arrow notation, and it was introduced because numbers like Graham's number literally couldn't be represented as simple power towers. So with this notation in mind, let's look at a simple process. We start with the number G1. This is 3 arrow 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 3, which is already stupidly larger than 3 arrow 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 3. But it gets crazier with G2, which is the number 3 with G1 arrows. We can see this function Gn is growing stupidly fast. Continuing to G3, we get G2 arrows, and so on. And when we get to G64, we've finally reached Graham's number. And there's simply no way to visualize this. Unlike a Googleplex, which I can put here as a single line, I can't can't even begin to explain how many digits it has. But the worst thing is, it doesn't end there. For the longest time, mathematicians hailed Graham's number as the largest number ever used in a serious mathematical proof. But there's a number far larger than Graham's number that's used to solve a game. Our game starts with three colors of dots, red, white, and blue, and we'll be connecting these to form trees. The first rule is that no tree can have more dots than there are trees, so the fourth tree can't have more than four dots. And the second rule is that no tree can contain another tree. This can look like this, or even this. That's because the nearest common ancestor of the red dot and blue dot is the white dot. With that being said, we can form the function tree n, which is the number of trees that can be formed with n different colored dots. With tree one, we can only make one, because every Every other tree contains this dot. Tree 2 has three trees, one with a red dot, one with a blue dot, and one with both dots. Now what about tree 3? Well this number is so large that mathematicians don't even know the value of it, let alone how many digits it has. But there is one thing they do know, and that's how long it would take to prove that it's finite. Using regular finite symbols like plus and times, it would take 2 tetrad to 1000, or a power tower of 1002's characters just to prove that it's finite. To put this into perspective, say I could write a character every single Planck time. This means that every second I'm writing this many symbols. Now go back in time 14 billion years to the Big Bang and start writing out the proof. You'll notice that by the time Earth spawns in, you've barely started, and when your friends come in, you've really made no progress. By the time the sun dies out, still the same, the Earth is gone. Oh nice, and eventually it all stops. Trillions of trillions of years in the future, we've reached the Poincaré recurrence time. This is when our universe resets itself. And as for the proof, you've barely even started. And that's just to prove that it's finite. You've done nothing to display the number itself, just prove that it's not infinite. At this scale, there's really no way to compare the sheer behemothicness of these numbers. When compared to tree three, Graham's number is effectively zero, but in a way we frustratingly can't imagine. But believe it or not, we can get even bigger, and that's what the ludicrously large right Number. The year is 2007, and MIT is hosting the Big Number Duel. Philosophy professors Augustine Ryo and Adam Elger go head to head to see who can think of the largest number. The only rule being, it had to be finite. The final number that Augustine Ryo conjured up is now known as Ryo's number, which is defined as, well, this. Another way to explain this would be the smallest number larger than any number expressible in the language of first order set theory in a Google symbols or less. Huh? Well first order set theory is a system that mathematicians use to formally describe objects, or in this case, numbers. The idea is that using these symbols you can represent numbers like tree 3 and Graham's number without making a dent in your allocation of symbols. This is very well defined and doesn't play on semantics like this guy's number plus one. In a colloquial setting, this number is currently known as the biggest number. Since its creation, there have been larger numbers created like Fish 7 and Bigfoot, but these lack rigor and are ill-defined. So for now, the biggest number is Ryo's number. But the story doesn't end there. People have fallen in love with the idea of the biggest number, so much so that a pseudo field of math has formed around it known as Googology the study of large numbers. This mathematics fandom discusses numbers from useful to stupid to more stupid. So if you want to have a bit of a laugh, scroll through the wiki. But as for me, that's all I've got left.